Well, I want to just um, pray one more time for us and for myself as well. So thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for uh, all those you've brought here this morning. And thank you for the opportunity to worship you together and lift our hands and praise to you. And thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for all that you've done for us through Jesus. And may he be lifted up and exalted today. And may you just speak through me, Lord, whatever you... Have uh, the message for your people today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to start out today just by saying thank you. Uh, thank you for so many of you who served uh, yesterday at our Red Village Road neighborhood barbecue. And it's good to have some of those neighbors with us today. And, um, and I, I just, it was such a, a huge outpouring of servant, uh, servanthood and um, and it, it was fun. Uh, um, and I just wanted to say thank you. I, I went home, I sat in my chair, and I just said, I am so proud of Linden Bible Church. <laughs> and just, uh, uh, I, th I think from all the feedback I received that we accomplished our purpose in encouraging our neighbors and blessing them. And so we're thankful for that. Um, so we served yesterday. We worked hard uh, leading up to this event. Today, we're going to rest, okay? So everybody go, ah. <laughs> you know, it's that season where the busyness of the fall season is upon us. Uh, all those things that have to be done before winter, you know. And, uh, you know, there's school, there's sports, there's special events, uh, and so oftentimes, you know, I was, I was looking out this morning, and I, we had our first frost, and, and I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, we, we, we had so much zucchini and tomatoes coming out our ears, and it never stops. And, and I, you know, all those plants, we said, oh, Lord, help them to grow in the spring. And now we're saying, die, die. You know? <laughs> and it just felt like, oh, grace. <laughs> but... Uh, so I don't know if you helped yesterday or if you had a, a busy day, week, month, year, uh, but uh, how many of us, and you don't have to raise your hand, how many of us are tired today? <laughs> well, if you are, you're apparently not alone. Um, people tell us, uh, experts tell us that Americans do not get enough sleep. In fact, sleep experts tell us that adults should need at least seven hours of, sleep, of uh, sleep a night for good health. And yet over one-third of Americans, uh, adults, get less than that for a huge variety of reasons. Uh, and it's interesting to me as I was looking at this that the need for sleep decreases with age, and it's almost kind of humorous. Newborns, uh, this is what the experts say, zero to three months, um, need 14 to 17 hours of sleep. Now that sounds great. If you're a, a mom with a newborn baby, 14 to 17 hours of sleep, I'm going to get some rest. What they don't tell you here is that they wake up every two hours to get fed and cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean much for mom. <laughs> Infants 4 to 12, years, uh, 12 months old need 12 to 16 hours of sleep. Toddlers 1 to 2 years old need 11 to 14 hours of sleep. And preschoolers 3 to 5 need 10 to 13 hours of sleep. School-age children 6 to 12 need 9 to 12 hours of sleep. And uh, teens, 13 to 17, need 8 to 10 hours of sleep. Um, the problem is, they don't all sleep at the same time. <laughs> and if you got, and this is why, by the way, that interestingly, having children under 18 is one of the factors that's associated with too little sleep. <laughs> I don't need to tell any mom that. <laughs> And uh, one of our young men this morning who's in, in school, and so a couple of his classes are ending this week, and, and I said, oh, so what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> so it just confirms. <laughs> uh, but adults need at least uh, seven hours of sleep or more, uh, according to the experts. And um, one reason for the lack of sleep is that 
over, there's over 80 different sleep disorders that plague people. Um, and it's estimated that at least 50 million Americans suffer from sleep disorders. And, uh, and that's a hard thing. And 100 million Americans say they don't get enough sleep. Um, and inadequate sleep can lead to all kinds of mental and physical problems such as weight gain, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, depression, and dementia, among many other things. <laughs> so we need to sleep more, apparently. Um, but the good news is that if you live in Vermont, Vermont is tied with Michigan for the states with the lowest percentage of adults who get less than seven hours of sleep. Only 29.6% of us <laughs> don't get enough sleep, so good job. <laughs> Now, if you live in New Hampshire, then uh, it's 33%, so sorry about you guys. If you live in New York, it's 38.4% that don't get enough sleep. That's not a surprise. That's why they're always in a hurry. They're trying to get home and go to bed. <laughs> well, sleep is a form of rest. And, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about rest. Um, Dictionary.com defines rest as... Uh, Number one, the refreshing quiet or repose of sleep, as in a good night's rest. Secondly, refreshing ease or inactivity after exertion or labor to allow an hour for rest. So that's, that's physical rest or sleep. Um, it also defines it as relief or freedom, especially from anything that wearies, troubles, or disturbs. This is more mental and emotional rest, a period of... In in a period or interval of inactivity, repose, solitude, or tranquility. When we say we want to go away for a rest, we're speaking of uh, not so much just physical rest. Um, and then there's mental or spiritual calm, tranquility. Um, you know, that, and we're going to sp speak a little bit about that, about p the rest of peace. And then there's uh, what we call uh, the repose of death or eternal rest. And finally, cessation or absence of motion, like to bring a machine to rest. So there's all different kinds of rest. There's physical rest or sleep. There's mental or emotional rest. There's relief or freedom from anxiety. And there's spiritual rest or tranquility and peace. Um, now, I have to give a little self-disclosure here. <laughs> um, rest isn't something I'm particularly good at. <laughs> Christy often says about me, you're a busy boy, <laughs> or sometimes busy as a, your bees. <laughs> and I think maybe that's why I like them so much, because they're, they're busy all the time, you know. A bee only lives on, in the summer about six weeks. Um, and, and the reason they, they don't last more than that is they literally fly their wings off. Um, you know, uh, to make a pound of that honey, um, it takes... Uh, Bees traveling the circumference of the earth <laughs> uh, in a hive. Um, they, interestingly, live longer. Uh, the bees that are born this time of year, they live six months. Um, so, you know, I, I'm into bees. You guys know that. Um, and by temperament, I am a doer, not a beer. <laughs> Uh, I'm more of a Martha than a Mary, if you know that story from Scripture, you know. Uh, Martha, having Jesus for dinner, uh, she's at the welcome wagon, she invites Jesus in, she's all excited, and but she became distracted by the many things that were required to prepare that meal, and she gets mad at her sister Mary, who's just sitting at the feet of Jesus, she's a beer, you know, and listening to him. And so she tries to co-op Jesus into guilting Mary into helping her prepare the dinner. But instead of rebuking Mary, Jesus gently rebukes Martha. Martha, Martha, you're distracted by so many things, but only one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen that part. Uh, and that was to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen, to rest, uh, and to have a spiritual rest before the Lord. Now, I, I, I've heard that some of the ancient versions include the last name of Martha, and it's Battaglia. <laughs> I'm, t I'm teasing. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of a Home Depot guy. Doers get more done. <laughs> uh, 
So, so I, I'm not necessarily good at rest, and uh, self-disclosure again, I did not get seven hours of rest last night. <laughs> so I'm preaching this to me uh, uh, as well as to you this morning. But as I said, the Bible has a lot to say about rest, and I want to focus on two aspects of rest this morning, physical rest and spiritual rest. You know, under the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, um, the Mosaic Law, there was a Sabbath rest. And that was a physical rest from work. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, On the seventh day, God finished his work, that's the work of creation, that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So God established right at creation, you know, after he he got done creating the world, he rested on the seventh day and, and, uh, and he blessed it and set it aside as a Sabbath, a day for physical rest, um, That physical, that Sabbath became a part of the law under the Old Covenant. In fact, it's the fourth commandment. And and we read in Exodus 20 about the the commandments. And in verses 8 through 11, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For, and he bases this, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So the, the example that God set down uh, in creation became part of the law. And Deuteronomy 5.15 tells us one of the reasons for that. You shall, after repeating the the law, the the commandment, it it says, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord uh, God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. You know, they were once slaves, weary, toil, endless toil, um, and God says, you need to remember, that's, that's where you came from. And so under me, under my covenant with you, I'm declaring a day of rest. One day in, in seven. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but yeah, it always makes me ask the question, what does it mean that God rested on the seventh day? Uh, you know, we know from all of Scripture that God is almighty. He's all-powerful. He is what we call omnipotent. So God has all power all the time, right? Uh, so how could he rest? Um, Genesis 17, 1, when he was, um, God was making a covenant with Abraham, it says, When Abraham was 19, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, and this was God's name for himself, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. So how can the Almighty God rest? Uh, Isaiah 40, verse 28 says, "Uh, Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So we know that uh, from all of Scripture um, that God's omnipotent and he doesn't get tired. (laughs) In fact, Jesus said, Once when he was being challenged about healing on the Sabbath, my father is working till now and I am working. God's always at work. Um, And Jesus said he's always at work too. Um, So God doesn't get tired or weary or need rest. I think to understand what is meant by God's rest, we have to understand the Hebrew name for Sabbath or Shabbat. It means to rest or to stop or to cease from work. So when God, it says that God rested on the seventh day, uh, it means that he saw that his work was good, it was complete, it was perfect, and it was finished. So he rested in the sense that he ceased, he stopped his creative work. So that's what it means. Um, God rested uh, because he, it was good. He, he declared over and over about the creation. It's good. It's very good. Um, it was all done, 
it was perfect, and so God stopped, or, or he rested uh, from his work. So God in his wisdom and, and grace established the, the Sabbath, or Shabbat, as a cessation from work as part of the law. It reminded his people Israel that they were no longer slaves, endlessly toiling and weary as they once were, but were now God's covenant people who were to rest from work one day in seven. And by the way, it's resting one day in seven, not seven days in seven, <laughs> not a lifestyle of laziness. Uh, Proverbs 6 tells us after talking about the ant and, you know, to learn from the ant who lays up, you know, her stores in the summer so that she has enough for the winter. We understand that. It says, how long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So <laughs> rest is not laziness either, <laughs> physical laziness. Um, but, you know, as New Covenant believers, uh, we are not under the Old Covenant law of Sabbath. God established um, a New Covenant through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. You remember last Sunday we celebrated communion, and, and some of the words we repeat in communion is, Jesus said, this cup is the New Covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we're, we're no longer on that old covenant uh, law. We're, uh, we're new covenant believers through Christ. Um, and nowhere is the fourth commandment repeated for believers in the New Testament. You know, Christians traditionally have worshipped on Sunday, not Saturday, which is a Sabbath, in celebration of Christ's resurrection. Um, the Sabbath was a cessation from work, but worship is continual, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They didn't just worship on the Sabbath in the Old Testament. They had daily sacrifices every day. That was a form of worship, and it was a foreshadowing of what is to come. And we're told in the New Testament that our worship of God, it's an it's a all-the-time kind of thing. It's an everyday kind of thing. So, so we, we worship not just on Saturday. We worship um, continually. Um, but um, you know, uh, the Sabbath was um, a, a rest from work. You know, it's interesting that Paul uh, tells us in Colossians two sixteen and 17 um, that we, that he says, therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So he, he's telling us, you know, some may, you know, don't, don't be put under some kind of legalistic bondage about the Sabbath uh, because we're new covenant believers. In Romans, he says, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and also gives thanks to God. So these verses remind us that we have freedom to observe any day as special or as a day of worship. Uh, though traditionally Christians have used Sunday uh, in recognition of Christ's resurrection. You know, I believe the principle of resting from work one day in seven is a wise one. <laughs> we need it to rest. We need it to be restored. We need it to be refreshed. And we need it sometimes for that repose or uh, solitude. And, you know, our wise creator knew what we were, that we were but dust as human beings. And, uh, and so he graciously gave us that principle. So my question to us, first of all, this morning is, are we taking time to get physical rest? Um, you know, sometimes I hear people boast, oh, I work seven days a week and I haven't taken a vacation in 10 years. And honestly, I, I feel sad about that. <laughs> uh, you know, God didn't, God didn't design us to be workaholics that never stop working. Um, not only is it unwise from a health standpoint, it's unbalanced relationally and spiritually. 
And I think it reveals a lack of trust in God's provision and his protection and probably is a source of pride. Um, it's interesting that in Psalm 127, 1 and 2, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. And there's an, actually an alternate translation there that says he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. I like both of those. <laughs> um, God blessed us with sleep. Uh, it's one of his gifts to us. And God blesses us. And when we trust God, when we don't feel like we've got to do it all, you know, we've got to be all things to everybody. Um, and we can trust God's protection of us. We can trust God's provision for us. Then you know what? God gives to us even in our sleep. Uh, uh, God, God will take care of us uh, when, we, when we aren't strong enough to do it all ourselves. Um, I think we need to learn to trust the Lord and take time for rest and refreshment and let God restore our spirits. And perhaps this is why we love the words of Psalm 23. No, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Isn't that, isn't that a great picture, you know, as God's sheep? He, you know, he doesn't drive us all the time. He, he invites us to be fed and nourished by him. He invites us to rest in him. Uh, what a great invitation. <laughs> but the principle of a Sabbath rest has a much deeper and fuller meaning in the, in the New Covenant than just a cessation from work. You see, just as the Old Covenant Sabbath was a physical cessation from work, in the New Covenant, Jesus becomes our spiritual Sabbath rest. He becomes our Sabbath rest. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Um, so in the New Testament, that Sabbath rest principle established by God at creation, incorporated into the Mosaic law, was a foreshadowing and finds its true fulfillment in Jesus Christ. He becomes our spiritual rest from work. You know, there's a great passage on this in the book of Hebrews, which is you know, a pretty deep book, but in Hebrews chapter 3 and, and 4, the author talks about finding our rest in, in Jesus. Um, in the book of Hebrews, the author is showing the superiority or the supremacy of Christ to, to all who came before him, the prophets and, 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 and everyone else and, and the angels and, and uh, that how the new covenant is, is inaugurated and surpasses the old covenant and he warns, he gives a, a lesson from those in the Old Testament. He warns his readers not to make the same mistake the Israelites, whom God delivered from slavery in Egypt, to bring them to a place of rest in the promised land. So it becomes a lesson in losing a place of rest because of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3, the author says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice... And this is this was what um, God was saying to those Israelites who were in the wilderness and and God was inviting them to the promised land, which was going to be the place of rest, the place of protection and safety and provision from God. And and and, you know, he, he's inviting them to to come to this promised land of rest and to trust in him, to take them there and and to provide that for him. But it says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. That was the, the wilderness journey. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. He's, he then warns us and these new Hebrew Christians, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ 
if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So we see he goes down in verse 19 to say that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. You know, the author to Hebrews is saying there's a lesson to be learned from those first generation of the wilderness who were delivered by the mighty hand of God from slavery in Egypt and were being brought to the promised place of rest because of their hard-hearted rebellion and disobedience in the wilderness, which was based on a failure to trust God and God's promises. And because of that, a whole generation of Israelites were not able to enter the rest that God has promised, had promised them. The next generation did trust God, and God brought them into the land. Uh, uh, But that generation did not. And the writer of the Hebrews is warning his readers, don't make the same mistake they did, and fail to enter the rest of God. Uh, And then in chapter 4 of Hebrews, the writer exhorts us to find in Jesus our Sabbath rest. He goes on to explain that just as they had the good news preached to them, theirs was, you know, if you trust me, I'll, I'll provide for you, I'll take you through the wilderness, and, and I'll give you the promised place of, le- of rest. But they failed to enter it by faith because of unbelief. So too, he says, we have good news preached to us, an invitation to the rest, to find rest in the person of Jesus. Oh. And the good news is that Christ fulfilled the requirements of the law perfectly, which they could never do, and became God's ultimate sacrifice for sin once for all through his death on the cross and resurrection to life. So we have the gospel, the good news. Uh, The good news that Jesus fulfilled the law and it passed away. Uh, He fulfilled it perfectly. You know, the problem of the Old Testament Mosaic law is they could never keep it. <laughs> and so they failed time after time. But Jesus came and he, he lived a perfect life and fulfilled God's law perfectly. Um, and, and he now becomes the good news that we can find rest in him. Not in something we do, not in trying harder, but in trusting in Jesus. Um, so we now have the opportunity to place our faith and trust in him and his work on the cross to save us. And when we do, here's the good news. Jesus becomes our Sabbath rest. Uh, We don't have to labor under the law, trying harder and harder to be good and and, and never succeeding. Um, We don't have to offer daily sacrifices to cover our sin when we fail because Hebrews tells us he offered one sacrifice for sins forever and then sat down at the right hand of God. Just like God did at creation, it's finished. (laughs) It's done. Uh The work of salvation is complete, the work of salvation is perfect, and the work of salvation is finished. This is why Jesus, one of his final words on the cross was, to tell us die, it is finished. (laughs) That's good news for us. All the work of salvation has been accomplished, not by our work, but by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross who died on the cross for our sins, rose again to new life to prove that that sacrifice was acceptable to God and that he was the son of God himself. Uh, Yeah, that's worth a hallelujah. (laughs) So the writer to Hebrews invites us to enter God's rest through Jesus. He says in Hebrews 4, verses 9 and 10, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Just as God set the Sabbath as a holy day of rest, so Jesus, the holy and perfect Son of God, sanctifies uh, and makes holy all who believe in him. He once was accused of breaking the Sabbath for healing a man, and his answer was the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. (laughs) You know, the Sabbath was ordained to relieve man of his work, And so in the same way, Jesus came to relieve us of the work of trying to achieve salvation by being good, by working for it. Um, When we trust in him and his sacrifice for our sin, Jesus becomes our Sabbath rest, not just for a day, but forever. (laughs) That's good news. You know, and 
Jesus provided, um, and, and the author of Hebrews is encouraging us to find our Sabbath rest in Christ. Um, and Jesus gives us an, a personal invitation to enter that rest. Some of my favorite verses in Scripture, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that good news? <laughs> you know, we don't have to labor uh, trying to be good enough for God. Uh, Jesus has done the work. It's all complete. It is finished. He just says, come to me. It's an invitation. Come to me. Those who are heavy, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, you know, and learn from me. In other words, come under, under who I am, my commands, my submission, submission to me. Become a follower of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. This is the only place in Scripture where Jesus described, where the heart of Jesus is explicitly stated for us. And what does it say about Jesus, who's calling us to a Sabbath rest in him? It says he is gentle, and it says he is lowly or humble in heart. That's the kind of Savior we have. He's attracted to our need. He's attracted to the fact that we're, we're sinful and can't solve that problem on our own. Uh, we can find victory in him, as we sang this morning. For he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, he invites us to get in the yoke with him, to follow him. And here's the good news. You know, you get in the yoke with Jesus. Think of those old, old uh, yokes that they used on oxen. We get in one half. Jesus gets on the other half. Guess who carries the load? Not us. <laughs> Jesus. All we got to do is follow where he goes. You know, when he says go here, we go this way, not this way. You know, <laughs> when he says go here, we go that way, not this way. It's always resistance to the yoke that makes it heavy for us. <laughs> as long as we're following him, listening to him, abiding in him. His yoke is very easy. We just have to strap in every day, you know, <laughs> and walk with Jesus and let him carry the load. That is finding rest in him. And I'll also say that that rest is, uh, though it's originally we, we find that rest in him for salvation, that it continued, we continue to find rest as we walk with him. You know, there's a great uh, picture and, and verse in Isaiah chapter 30. Um, in Isaiah chapter 30, um, you know, the Israelites, they, you know, God was inviting them to, to rest in him and and uh, to trust in him, and, and they were always had their own way of doing things, you know. Well, we, you know, we, you know we, we're in trouble here. We're surrounded by the superpowers of the day, and, and we'll go get help from Egypt. And, uh, and God's like, no, no, I'm God. I can protect you. Don't put your trust in them. It's going to fail you. Uh, and, and, you know, he kept telling them, he kept inviting, just trust me to protect you. Just trust me to provide for you. But over and over it said they wouldn't, they wouldn't. And so God says, prior to this verse, he says, you know, your trust in them is going to be like trusting in a big, you know, brick wall, <laughs> stone wall. The problem is that wall has a big bulge in it. What does that mean? That means it's about to come down. And when your trust in something other than me crashes, he said, there won't be enough there it, it, it will be a total crash. You know, it'll be like a pot that's been shattered. You won't even find a piece big enough to scrape ashes from the fire. And then he issues this invitation. I love this invitation. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning or repentance and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Unfortunately, they were not willing. And so God says, okay, you don't want to trust in me? Run. And you'll run, and I'll send people after you. <laughs> and you'll end up alone on a hill, <laughs> all alone, clinging to, you know, all of your self-effort. And he said, maybe then, and he issues a, an invitation again. No, come to me. Come to me. In repentance or re returning and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. Find your rest. Find your trust in God. 
Jeremiah 6, 16 has a, has a similar kind of message. It says, thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But again, they weren't willing to do that. And that's why they're used as an example in the Old Testament. Uh, so Jesus is uh, issuing a call to rest, just as God issued a call to rest of his people in the Old Testament. Can I ask you this morning, have you ever accepted Jesus' invitation to come to him for rest, to come to him for salvation, to trust in him and his finished, complete, and perfect work on the cross to save you from your sin? You know, you, maybe you say, you're sitting here this morning and you say, well, how do I do that? Well, it's pretty simple. It's called the gospel. It's the good news. Uh, the gospel is, is simply this, that we have to admit we're a sinner for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Paul says, um, and that the wages of sin is death, separation from God, but the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, it's just admitting I can't, I can't work my way there. I can't save myself. I, I, I'm never going to get there. I need you. <laughs> I need your work on the cross to save me. As Paul goes on to say, but God demonstrated his love toward us. This, this is his motivation. It's because he loves us. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, while we were walking away from him, <laughs> while we were going the wrong way, while we were trusting in ourselves, oh, Christ died for us. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> We, we were rebels just like the, the Israelites, you know, walking away. We'll, we'll figure it out on our own, God. You know, we don't need you, you know. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm my own man. I'm my own woman, and I'll, I'll find a way through. And God says, no, you won't. <laughs> You're not good enough because God's standard is perfection, and none of us are perfect. Uh, so turn away from your way of doing things. That's called repentance. And follow God's way. And God's way is simple. Trust in Jesus. Believe and trust in Jesus and his work on the cross. And that alone to save you from your sin. John 3.16. How do we do that? John 3.16. Famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish. But have eternal life. If you've never made that decision this morning, I would invite you in the quietness of, the, of this time to just reach out to God, to just say, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I realize I can, I'm never going to be good enough to get there on my own. I need salvation through Jesus Christ. Will you, will you, I'm going to place my faith and trust in Jesus today and what he did on the cross for you to save me. You know, Hebrews chapter 3, the writer of the Hebrews said, today is the day. <laughs> today. <laughs> and today's a great day to come to salvation in Christ. Oh. But after we do that, you know, it's still required of us that we will maintain our rest in Jesus. Oh. You know, sometimes even as believers who found, who's, who found a rest in Christ and his work on the cross for us, we can kind of forget and go back to just being restless, <laughs> you know, filled with anxiety. Um, and we're not alone. You know, I was looking up these verses from, from Paul. You know, the great apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, 5, for even when we were, came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, you know, physical rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without fear within. That doesn't sound restful, <laughs> you know. He was burdened with ministry. <laughs> he was burdened with the difficulties. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, verses 7 through 12, after Paul says, you know, God gave me this great, this great vision from him, he said, so to keep me from becoming conceited, to keep me humble, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being, becoming conceited. 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. You know, please, God, take away this, this ailment, whatever it was <laughs> that he had. Uh, the Apostle Paul is praying this. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, Paul could say, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ. Then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. <laughs> you know, sometimes when we're stressed and, uh, and oppressed <laughs> and struggling, um, and, and we, we come to that understanding that, you know, I'm just... I can't handle this. <laughs> That's a wonderful time to find our rest in Christ again. <laughs> That's a wonderful time to answer the invitation to come to Jesus again. Uh, that's a wonderful time to, to abide in him uh, and find our rest in him. Uh, because you know what? God says the weaker we are, the stronger he is in us. Isn't that wonderful? It's okay to be weak, people. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> you know, I pray every time before I get up here, just about every Sunday, Lord, I'm not adequate for this. <laughs> I know I'm not. <laughs> Second Corinthians 3. But you know what? I have Jesus, and he is always adequate. And so will you let Jesus live his adequacy out through me? Because I can't do this <laughs> on my own. I need Jesus to be my strength. When we're weak, he's strong. And so we have to get comfortable. I don't know. The Apostle Paul said he got comfortable with weakness. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with weakness yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> There's a, a great verse in Psalm 116.7. It says, Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. So can I invite you this morning? Maybe you're a believer, but you're, you've been stressed and harassed and under it. Hey, return to your rest, the rest that you find in Jesus. He's, he's done all the work. It's perfect. It's complete. It's finished. He's issued an invitation. Come to me. Keep coming to me. <laughs> when you're weary, when you're heavy laden, and it's a promise, and I will give you rest. I mean, this is spiritual rest. This is, this is probably, you know, emotional and mental rest as well. Oh, find our rest in him. Jesus said, encouraged us to abide in him. Abide in me and I in you. For as the, the branch, um, the vine cannot, I'm not, for as the, vine can, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. We maintain our rest by abiding in our relationship with Jesus, by renewing that day by day by day, by doing that continual worship that God calls us to. And then finally, as we do all of that, particularly as we take Jesus' invitation to rest in him for salvation, the Bible speaks of an eternal rest. You know, in Revelation chapter 14, um, you know, the final um, kind of judgment of God. There's, there's a great contrast and a choice there. Um, one is a terrible, uh, a terrible result, and the, one, the other is a wonderful result. God's telling us about when he wraps up history and, and he throws Satan and, and the demons into the lake of fire and to hell, and it says, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest. That's hell. No rest. Um, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, those who failed to trust in God, and, and whoever receives the marks of its name. You know, that's, that's a terrible um, penalty for not accepting the rest that we need to find in Jesus through the cross of Christ. But then, it's just two verses later, it says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. 
you know, maybe today we need to return to our place of rest in Jesus and then be assured of an eternal rest in him. You know, when we use that expression, rest in him, uh, you know, rest in peace, it's speaking of eternal rest in the arms of the Lord. <laughs> Wonderful day yesterday. <laughs> um, got a text in the middle of the day. <laughs> Sorry, I lost a good friend. Um, some of you know her. Um, sorry. <laughs> Gwen Maynard, um, one of the sweetest ladies of God I've ever known. <laughs> she has been an inspiration to Christy and I all of our lives of ministry. Ran, ran a little bit of uh, a, a, a bed and breakfast up in, uh, on Shadow Lake and Glover, uh, haven of rest. <laughs> And uh, she let pastors come there for free, and, and uh, she couldn't do enough for you when you got there. <laughs> and she was just, just to be with her was the real blessing. But then she would bless you in all kinds of ways. And, uh, and her daughter uh, texted me yesterday and said, I just want you to know, Mom, Mom passed away this morning. And, uh, and I just wrote back, I said, you know, I'm so happy for her, because I know that she is enjoying heaven <laughs> and she is with her savior whom she loved and uh and i, I know i'm gonna see her again <laughs> and uh and what a sweet sweet lady and privilege it was to know her you know that can be our story huh? i hope that people will say that about us when god takes us home you know that people will be able to say wow what a what a sweet guy. What a sweet woman. Uh, and I know, I know that I know that they're in heaven with their Jesus today. And I'm going to see them again. I want that for each and every one of us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this invitation to rest in you, to rest in Jesus, our Savior, today. I thank you for... Uh, the, the peace, the calm, the tranquility, the joy, and, and all that it brings to us. We don't always find it, Lord. Sometimes we still struggle. Sometimes we get restless, um, and we have to keep coming back. But I just want to pray if there's one here this morning that doesn't know you, that's never entered initially into the rest of Jesus Christ. And if you're that person this morning, I just want to invite you to, to silently pray after me. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a, I'm a sinner and I need your grace in my life. I need Jesus. Uh, so will you come into my heart and life today and forgive me of my sin and help me to find eternal rest in him. Thank you for saving me this morning. And Father, I thank you for the rest we have in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.